Hello, everybody. This is Mike Pucciarelli, and tonight I'll be talking about the black plexus table, but with continuous lighting. And I first want to give an introduction to who I am. I started digital photography in 2010. I started out as a landscape photographer and then and I experimented with other types of photography. In 2013, I graduated with a social degree from Montgomery College. And then 2015, I joined Professional Photographers of America, learned a lot, made, made many good um, connections. In 2017 and later, I joined some of the affiliate clubs. They made more connections, did more networking. And then 2021, I joined American Society of Photographers. And that's when I got my Craftsman degree. And in 2022, I received my CVP, my Certificate for Professional Photographer. It's where you take a rigorous 100 question exam and image evaluation. Yeah, I've learned a lot, but I still have more to learn. So tonight we're talking about, you know, the black flex table with continuous light. So every agenda, we'll be talking about, you know, the black flex table. And I'll be talking about how to use one light with modifiers. And I could talk about how to use modifiers without adding another light. And so and I'll talk about some equipments you can buy retail, you can buy, you can make, you can buy online. And so now I'll be talking about the camera settings with the R5 and R6. I now use both. Both are great. Both cameras are similar, but there's differences, but they both help me do my job well. And so I'll be have a demo in using Bridge and Photoshop, and then I'll have a like a screenshot of Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw for more clarification. If you have any questions, you can always email me at you know mputrelart 16 at gmail.com. You can also put questions in the chat and I'll try to check the chat. You can just interrupt if you have a question. So there's many ways you know to ask questions. So I'm going to go to my portfolio. So I'll be talking about, I use continuous light with this image and this image and this image. So we're talking about these three. I know this is not perfect, but I was just experimenting. There's many ways to make the background more interesting. This is my light painting. This is a different type of photography. And light painting a car. I use LED lights. This is in a studio, light painting a motorcycle with LED lights. When I use LED lights, you know, I light paint part of it and I put it, I put the exposures in a big master file and I produce one image. So this could be like, 30 exposures. Another light painting. This is my black and white. I took a road trip and I explored some architecture. So these are my still life tables. And tonight we'll be focusing on the table in the upper right corner, a black plexiglass table. There are many ways you can use this table. And the bottom two tables are for light painting or natural light. And this, of course, is the white flex table. But tonight our focus is on a black flex table. Now, there are modifiers you can use with any table, and that includes the black flex table. You know, if you have one light, and if you want to like add light without, you know, using another light, you can use mirror or silver or gold cards. Uh, add light in a dramatic way. It's great to add light, you know, to the shadows, make the photograph look more natural. You do the same with silver reflectors. But then, if you want to add light in a soft way, you can use white reflectors, white cards. And then you have black cards where black cards are great. 
or blocking too much light or when the strobe bleeds too much light. Then this plastic fusion scrims, I'll be talking a lot about this tonight. With the block flex table, there's many ways you can use them. You know, the 40 degree angle, the 90 degree. I'll talk about that later. Then there's colorful gels. And the way, there are, many, there are many ways you could use gels. I mean, everyone has their style. I use gels with the black flex table in a certain way. And then there's medium sized white flexi sheets where you can put this in front of a light to make the light softer. And then a cinefill, which is black, you know, aluminum foil. And that's great for creating like a snoop if you're on a really tight budget. Then for controlling natural light, you could work with the blinds. You could angle the light at a 40 degree angle and it looks rich with contrast. And the tools below, like the spring clamps, CRG clamps, they're great for holding stuff like duct tape and clothespins. Duct tape and clothespins, you know, are great for, you know, attaching gels or even fusion paper to a soft box of a strobe or a light. You could buy a lot of this at an art store. You could buy a lot of this online or like a store like Michael's. This is my black flex table. It looks like with the scrim, it's at 40 Fredrick angles where this is a great setup if you want to photograph a piece of drooly, you want to lay it flat like a watch, like you saw in the portfolio photograph. And these are basically saw horses. And this is cloth, but underneath the cloth, they have plywood. And I put cloth, so it won't scratch the plexiglass. And these are holes, and I have holes drilled into the plywood. So this will hold it up good. Now, if you want to add light without adding another strobe, I recommend putting like a mirror here, a reflector. But sometimes, you know, you need another light, and I'll talk about that later. So you have a you have a black cloth and then black. a plexiglass on top of it? Oh, yeah. So you just won't scratch the plexiglass. Okay, got it. Yeah. So this is, you know... The 40 degree angle and the light is perpendicular to the slant because the light is an aim at the table and that's where you're going to put your drooly and then you aim the camera at the lighted uh, drooly. Tricky thing is you want to make sure the light is aiming at the subject. You want to make sure the you know camera angle is appropriate. That's why you know angle of the light, angle of the camera is very important. You know in any still life photography, especially you know, the black plexiglass table. This is how to use a scrim with 90 degrees, where you have a glass subject, you'd fire the light right through. So the light would face the subject. And there's many ways you could create natural vignetting or non-vignetting. I'll talk about that later. And again, this is great for glass subjects. And if you want to add light, I'd recommend a white card or silver card. But since there's so much light, you probably won't need it. But there's ways you could, you know, make the light even with white or silver cards. Now, if this were a non glass subject, I'd have to have a light over here or a light over here. But, and I'll talk about that later. And I recommend before adding the light, try to add it with like a mirror or a reflector. This is the same thing with a glass subject. As you know, it, I'm cutting the light in half where you see like half the circle. This will create like a nice cool vignetting. And if I were to do this, these C clamps wouldn't be here, but I just decided to leave them there. But, and if you want to make the light less intense, you could lower the power of the light. You can move the light like two feet away or one feet away. And this is a nice vignetting. And this is great for, you know, a glass subject. And if this were a non-glass subject, I'd have to have another light either on top or at an angle. Where is the light? Behind the plexiglass? This lies behind the scrim. This is like a scrim. I see. A frame scrim with uh, plastic fusion paper. 
So, Mike, did you take this in a in the dark? Yeah. On this one. Okay. And how do you keep black plexiglass without with dust free? Well, I'll talk about that later. You can have a lens blower. There's like Novus. You shine it up, and I'd recommend you know blowing it with the with the lens blower, and also with the soft cloth. Okay. And I'll show you some cleaning tools later. This is another way to use a black flex table where the light is up. I decided to do something different because I want to bring this out more than the reflection. And if I want to make the light less intense, you know, I could lower the power of the light. I can move the light a foot away. The key thing is fix your light and then fix the exposure on the camera. You know, you want to work on the light first and then work on the exposure. This is, you know, a big light, a Westcott D5 with a big soft box. And I use the Westcott Spiders, um, you know, lighting where it's not flashed, it's continuous lighting. And I'll talk about the bulbs later, but this is great because this is glass. And if you want to bring out the edges, this is one way to do it. And if you want to um, make the edges bigger, you bring the light away from the foam board. If you want to make it smaller, you bring it closer to the foam board. This is another light where you could have like a, a photovec or a west dot, you know, light where it's aiming at the bottle. This is a way to do food too, because you want to produce light, but you also want to produce shadows. And I have a soft box to make the light, you know, softer. Hey, hey Michael, mm -hmm. what are we looking at? Could you explain what we're looking at? This is the bottle on a slant and the lights. So when you photograph this, it'll be like a floating on a black plexiglass. Okay, so you got a plexiglass uh, underneath it. Then yeah. you have silver and white cards. Uh, where are those located relative to the soft box? It's over here. I just want to put in light in a soft way. So the light's coming over here. And I want to um, put a little detail to the shadow with the, with the white card in a soft way. So the white cards are blocking the light or are they softening the light? Well, it's putting in, this is softening the light. I understand. This is just adding soft detail to the shadow. I see. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Now this is with two lights where if this were, suppose you wanted to add a little more detail, you would have to get another LED light or just a continuous light. I'd get another, you know, Westcott D5. And you can put silver cards for shadows, for more shadow detail. And this could be in the light and back it's firing. It could be a D5 or another or impact flood reflector. So there's many, you know, continuous lights you can use. And where would you put the camera? Uh, at an angle, almost a straight shooting into? Oh, the amber, the camera would be angled down. Now, if this were glass, this for <laughs> angle, the camera would be aiming straight, but the, the camera would be, ang be angled down. Why would you angle it down? Because this is a flat. <laughs> you want Because it's the way it's displayed. I mean, this is a way to photograph Drooly or something flat. So if the camera is a is angled to the subject. And I assume that a small thing in the center of the plexiglass is the subject. Right. Then what you're trying to do is catch the reflection of the subject on the plexiglass. That's why you're angling it down. Yeah. 
This light's gonna get over here. If this is like a mug or something a little taller, I have to get another light. Maybe I could try it at the mirror first. And the camera would be angling down. This is really a flat piece. It's a good way to do drooly, but I'm just trying to put a little more detail in the shadow. And sometimes you need more than a reflector. You need another light. So Michael, did you, uh, the, the watch picture that you showed before, did you take it on this setup here? And was that the outcome or did you have to do a lot of editing? Oh, editing, yes. Like for instance, you may have to clean out some dust spots. Oh, or just- this. We have work to do, but you want to try to make the file perfect before Photoshop, but, but Photoshop is powerful. And I'll talk about that later tonight in the, in the lecture. Okay. This is another light way to use it. It's where this is a scrim. It's made out of stretcher art frames. And this is Asian draft paper. You could buy this at any art store. All this at BH. And this is a mug where if this were the only light, this would be like a silhouette. That's what I want to find, but I don't. And that's why I have a light coming at a 40 degree angle, either a big continuous softbox or an F5 or a photovic. And a D5 has five bulbs. And the photo effect has like seven bulbs. And I'll show what those look like later. And you can also add silver white cards for shadow detail. Got it. And what are you exposing for? I'm exposing for this. Okay. So you get the, the backlight coming in and then properly exposed by that um, soft light uh, as well as a card. The white reflection, got it. What I do is, it's called a two to one relationship where this is, the key light is two times brighter than the backlight. Okay. This is another way to do a watch where I have it stood up, where I have light coming here and I have light coming here. And that's a lot of light. And the light's angle is at, the lights, you know, they light what you want to photograph. And sometimes it's too much light, so I have to cut part of the light by moving the light closer to the softbox, I mean, to the um, blackboard, foam blackboard. And this is like a big black card. So if it's bleeding too much light, I would tilt the light more to the right so it cuts some of the unwanted control light to get what you like. And both are aimed at a 40, 50 angle. This is two lights with natural light and it's blown out, but I'd correct this by, you know, shutting down the blinds. And also tone down, you know, the soft boxes. So it looks more natural. And it, we have two, you know, D5s that I'll, show what the switches look like and because there's ways you control the lights on a d5 and other you know lights similar this is three lights where you have a d5 a d5 a big soft box suppose there's not any sunlight i would have to use this so to make it natural i would try to work with the regular light and then maybe use this so all depends on what lighting you have available, the ambient lighting. Okay. Hey, Michael, question for you. Yeah. The, the black background, go back to the previous slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. So the black background, did you kill the ambient light or there is a black something behind it? This is a foam board. Okay. Not okay. Black backgrounds. All right. Now these are CAG clamps where they hold up the scrims at a 40 degree angle. And this is also at a 90 degree angle. And you could also do this with spring clamps, both this. And these are both spring clamps doing the same thing, 40 degree angle and a 90 degree angle. Now the many ways you use gel, 
And there's some photographers, they put gels on every light. I don't do that. I just want to have gel on the background light. And that's why I just want to use like a blue for a nice calm effect or green. That's why if I were, I would have this face the camera, I put a foam board. So I have a little bluish taint in the edges. So there's many things you can do with gel. I think it's just a matter of style, but I use gel a certain way with the black plexiglass table. So what we're looking at is a large piece of blue gel, two large pieces. Yeah. And then you have a light box behind it, uh, no, a soft no. box. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and then I'd have a foam board, but you could also have this aim at the subject too, or at the background, but many ways you use gel. So this would be your background and your plexiglass would be sitting in front of it? What I would do is I would have this face the light. I'd have a foam board and this would be at full power. And I'd move the glass depending on how big I want the light streak, light streaks. But you can aim blue, a gel, a light at a subject. You could have, you could have, you know, two gels, you can have, four, but I just like to keep things simple, a simple color gel. Okay, I assume your next picture shows where the object is and uh, uh, relative to the gels, right? Yeah. Okay. Now these little bulbs, I like, I'll talk about the bulbs later. These are great lead bulbs. I think they're about 5,000 lumens. It's great soft light. This is a soft box and this is without the soft box. And if I want to put a scrim, I just put the scrim in front of the soft box. And then there are walls where if I have a light over here, I could, you know, put some, some light will bounce off into a soft way on the subject. These are scrims. And these are you know, white foam boards. And this would, so if I had the strobe here, I'd put some soft detail in the shadow. And you can also do this with, you know, silver cards. Silver cards would put a more dramatic detail in the shadow. Then there's black cards where if I want to, if a light, you know, gives out too much, I could take away that unlighted light in the photograph. So I want to pause for any questions. I know I've answered a lot. Yeah, it really would be nice, for example, that the image that we're looking at, if we could see the location of the camera and the final image. Yeah. Okay. These are just regular still at tables for light painting. That's a whole nother lecture. But now I'm gonna talk about camera settings and I'll be referring to the Canon R5 and R6 because they're very, very similar. Now in regular, Flat, larger still life, I always like to use manual. In light painting, I like to use bulb. But this is what my camera could look like doing still life, where I'd start with 125th, aperture 16. I always want to use ISO of 100. I never want to use auto ISO because you're not controlling the ISO. And I shoot in raw. And I just, you know, it's C-RAW, condensed RAW, in the smallest JPEG. And I just use a JPEG if I want to see the photograph on the phone. So the JPEG will go to the phone. So I start with RAW, and then I convert to the DNG. And the GNG files, they work better than the CR3 files. They come up quicker when you launch a folder of them in Windows Explorer. And for all my still life, I always want to use the autofocus. I'm going to talk a lot more about these settings coming up. Now, 
All these modes are great, but I always want to use a single shooting mode because I'm in a tripod all the time with my still life. But I've worked with all these modes, they're great. I've had the 10 second exposure for self portraits. And sometimes I could use a two second exposure in place of the single shooting. Hey, Michael, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned you use autofocus. Yeah. What, what's your reason for autofocus versus manual focus? Well, manual focus, um, manual, I use autofocus. I use focus in two ways. I use just regular autofocus for my regular still life and outdoor. And then I do light painting. I do a preset with an autofocus, then I switch it to manual. Okay, yep. Because when I light paint, I don't want the sensor to think too hard when it takes the exposure. When I light, when I do still life photography with the light, I'm not in the dark. Now, I always like to use the picture style mode. It applies a little sharpening to the image, but the others are great. And you have the user settings, like if you do handheld, like one, two, three, you can adjust things the way you like. I don't like monochrome because I don't want to affect the raw pixels before bringing them to the computer. And then there's neutral where there's no settings applied. So I always like to use a standard and it helps me you know, get the image that I like. All these, you know, picture modes are great for their uses. Focus mode. I always want to use the zone autofocus because we focus on several parts of the photograph. When I use my 7D, I'd always do this, and I still want to do it with my R6 and R5. But mirrorless has made improvements on all these areas. And I've tested out the vertical, the vertical zone autofocus and the horizontal. Vertical is great for if you want to photograph like a portrait type photograph. Horizontal is great when you want to photograph like a wide still life. But I would like to just stay with the autofocus, zone autofocus regular, which is here. Then there's one, you know, 1053 point where camera has to reset, but I've tried this and this works well. Then the single point where you basically move the focus and then there's spot out of focus for great for macro. And then the tracking where I use it for the portraits, I use it for the animals and I use it for, you know, objects. And we enable the tracking, you can also enable the eyes. So the eyes can come out a little better in the photograph. But for regular still life, I just want to use the zone autofocus for the regular. And the white balance, I always want to either use the daylight option or set the Kelvin at 54 to 56K. I never use the AWS because it's at least natural and you could be putting artificial ingredients in the photograph. And then there's a custom white balance and I've used that, but if the light changes, then you have to do new custom white balance. And that's why I'd just rather either use the daylight or just set the Kelvin at 54 to 56K. That's what natural daylight looks like. Then there's high speed ISO noise reduction. The properly exposed image, I would disable it. You could use low, but you should avoid using standard, but maybe for a very high ISO, but you probably won't notice it with today's DLSLRs, but I would just either, you know, use disable it or use low. And I just rather, you know, disable it because if you use the wrong setting of the camera, it can affect the pixels. Then the long exposure noise reduction. Auto is for automatic. Enable is something is always happening. The algorithm always takes place when you finish a shot. So if you're taking fireworks, this would not be the setting to use. And that's why I'd rather just, just disable it for a regular proper exposed image. Color space. I use two color spaces. I start with the Adobe RGB. You have over 57 billion colors. And then I use the sRGB 
which is down to like 17 million colors. So when I copy and paste in Photoshop, I don't check off that convert the sRGB, but when I post to the web, I do. Because I when I because I tried, you know, doing the opposite. I had an ugly color mismatch problem. So that's why I decided to when I copy and paste in Photoshop, I make sure I don't check off convert the sRGB. I know some people use Profoto, but I'd rather just use Adobe and then work with sRGB. You know, the human eye can only recognize two or three million colors. And a lot of colors with the Profoto, even with Adobe, human eye cannot recognize. Then the CMYK, it's great for printing, but I just, you know, work with RG, the two RGBs, S and the regular Adobe. The cropping ratio, so if you're using full frame, I always want to use full because using all the pixel power. The other um, ratios don't, but they're good for their uses. Like the 1.6 is great for the sensor C lens, but I don't use the sensor C lens anymore. I use all the non-sensor C lens. And that's why it's funny to use the full pixel so that you get you take advantage of all the pixels. I'll just propose a bracketing where I do it in three stops where I expose for the highlights where and so when I first take a shot, it'll be underexposed, but then the overexposed will be hopefully not overexposed because I want to avoid the blinkies. To avoid the blinkies, you can work with all the pixels of the image. And that's why I just want to expose for the highlights and go a stop more narrow. Why are you bracketing to combine it later, or when you're when everything's under your control? Why are you bracketing? This is what I do for outdoor photography. I see. Okay. When I do like uh, waterfalls, and I try to with still life, but this is really better for outdoor nature with the regular ambient light. Now the continuous focus. You know when I burnt my R six. And I always be focusing because by default, they enable it. You can disable it by just going to the settings, or you can also just switch it to the manual focus. So it's better to disable the AF, continuous AF, because you're in control of the focus, not the camera always adjusting the focus. And so I always want to, yeah, when I turn on the camera, the thing will be disabled. So when I, when I press the focus button, the camera will focus. And I always use exposure increments one third, ISO one third. And with mirrorless and also the later cannons, you could have many more than three bracketed shots, but I still use three. Now the and cannon, you know, the cards for the R5, R6 is, you know, you can use both cameras, you can use two cards. You could record to both cards. You can go from card one to card two when card one's full. Some people do two cards, one's for backup, one's for regular, you know. So it'll take both the same picture, but if you delete a file on card one, it'll still be the file on card two. So maybe if you go on those lifetime trips, you wanna, you know, use two cards, just delete a file, a photo from one card and the card two would be the backup in case you didn't mean to delete it. Then the R5, R6 both work with the XC and HC, where the XC is a greater speed and greater storage. But the R5 uses the CF, you know, type B. This is great for data. This is also great for storing, you know, 4K and you know, HD video. So the only R5 could use the type B. It's great for speed. You have like 1800 megabits per second, over a thousand megabits per second. Yeah, expensive cards. I use yeah, it. They're good. Yeah, they are expensive. So this is the Wi-Fi where it's similar to both the R5, R6, 
You want to make sure you turn off your airplane mode. You want to enable your Wi-Fi, your Bluetooth. And this is with my, you know, R6. So this is an R5 would be the R5. This is what I'm waiting where this is on the camera. So the camera is telling me to connect to the software and then we just wait for the connection. And it's like this both for the R5 and R6. So then the R5, R6, they're very similar, but the difference in file sizes, the R5 is twice as big as the R6. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Why were you connecting to Wi-Fi? Are you displaying it somewhere else? You didn't say that. Oh, I'm using my phone to look at the photograph if I want to. Or I could also, you, you could also do it with your computer, but if I light paint a car, I can't bring my desktop with me. That's why I use my phone. Okay, got it. Yeah, so there's many ways to use the Wi-Fi. And I recommend the condensed RAW or the RAW, and you convert them to D DNG. And I just use my JPEG if I want to see my the photo on my droid. And I just work with the DNG files after I convert them from the RAW. And these are my strip D5s. It comes with the bulb, it's over 5,000 lumens, and it's very soft light. And these are the switches where I can turn the switch. So these switches are for the five bulbs. So I could have one on, three on, five on, or I could just have two on and four on, and the rest off. And it's great for putting in a little shadow or contrast in the light. So you get a maximum of 25,000 lumens? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah. And also the mirror bring helps illuminate the light too. The silver part. This is a photo back. This is like a seven socket. In this light, there's a switch for the rows. It controls the roll of lights. There's a switch for this row. There's a switch for this row. And this is great, and it uses works well with the eco bulbs, like the other, you know, light. And then it has um, mirror, like silver reflectors, to make to illuminate the light even more. It also uses product like the other light with an umbrella, but I just recommend you know the soft box with the reflecting material for the illuminating the light. And both lights come with like a three prong plug and also a switch on the plug. This is the regular impact re reflective floodlight where the so lumens, actually the five, it was the temperature was 5,000 K and the lumens is 1,700 lumens. 5,000 K because it looks natural. So a lot of people find this confusing. I do too, but so it's lumens of 1,700. That's a lot of lumens. These are all my stands. I have big stands, I have boom stands. I have small stands, I have ground stands. And some of the stands come with sandbags, they're rocks in. And sometimes I have to buy them at a hardware store. You got silver or white reflectors are great for adding in details, either a dramatic or a soft way. Then you have snoots. You want to make sure that you always want to use them with the grid for the flattering light, whether you use flash or continuous. And the lid comes with gels, but I never use the small circular gels, but some people do. Do you like those Godox snoots? Yeah, these are good. They are good? Now, they do heat up, so I want to warn you, but you can always turn off the strobe or the light to cool down. And you do you put the grid on these or no? Oh, I do. You always okay. want to have the grid on. Right. Yeah. 
And these are like reflector bowls where the light also, the, the silver part will help illuminate the light even more. There's a high quality lumen that lasts a lifetime. These are cement rocks, like you saw them holding my stand, but you could also stand it up. You could put a foam board on the little indentation here. And you have crates where sometimes managers throw you know, them away. I grabbed a few. So you can put a light on, you can store stuff. And the same thing with the bucket. Actually, I bought the bucket from the hardware store, but sometimes you can see this on like on the side of the road. So if you see one, you might want to grab it. And sometimes I make my own still tables with wood that people get rid of. And I just buy the L brackets. And sometimes these are great for like a small still black table. You put like a like a small, you know, black plexiglass on top. And I made this homemade rack out of wood where I now store all my uh, foam boards. But you can extend the poles for a nice cool background. These are my cubes. Some people use apple boxes. I just like to use cubes because they're light, they're easy to move. And you can put like a black plexiglass for a small table. And you can do the same thing with this high stool and also this low stool. And these used to be chairs, but the arms are coming apart. I didn't want to throw this away. I just sold off the arms. And these are good stools. It's a floor rack where Really, this I like to use this for life, but I when I bought a dishwasher, I didn't want to throw this away. And I also screwed on a piece of wood. So you can angle a light. You can have a light aiming up. So I use this for I want to put a light on the floor. My big black card bees. It's a great way to create a back black background. It's also a great way to block when too much light is hitting the subjects. These are my expansion poles. These are worth purchasing. Where these are attached with C or G clamps. This is holding up like a passive fusion scrim. You can put like a white reflector, you can put a foam board, anything you need. My regular one inch poles, where on the plex table, I'd have them in the holes. It would hold up the scrim at a 40 from the angle. And these, you could do the same thing. You could also use the background, but you could also put this to hold up a scrim at a 40 from the angle. Here's the lens that I use. A lot of times, I like to start with 35. Now, if I'm doing product, I rather use 85 or 50. And I like to use the prime lenses because they're sharper focus and they're cheaper, but they serve the well many years. Now outdoor, then I like to use the 7200 to 100 to 400. Now the mirrorless R5, R6, they, I'd recommend you the R5, R6 or R3. They work well. They help a lot of people do the jobs. I know there's the R7 where you can print and other, but technology is amazing, but I'm very happy with my R6 and R5. I'm very thankful for the Canon converter, where I can use my, and any non-offer lens. And I have a YouTube video on how this works, the R6, and also a YouTube video on the R5. I'm very thankful for this converter. And a lot of people use the converters because it's saving people money. Now about the image stabilization, Nikon calls it vibrant reduction. I always have this turned off because a lot of times I just use my tripod. I never pick up a camera, I don't even bother to turn it on because I wanna make sure that my, pho my photographs are sharp. Now if you use this with the tripod, yeah, turn it off. But if you take it off the tripod, you turn it on, but if you don't use it correctly, you could have problems with the pixels. And for the manual focus autofocus, like I said, I use autofocus for my burger still life and outdoor. But for light painting, I start with an autofocus and I switch to manual. 
So in a light painting in the dark, the sensor, you just take the shot and it's already, you know, focused from the pre-focus from the autofocus. And these are camera cases. These are tough and sturdy. They're cheap. They're small. You can buy this in the computer hardware store. I still, I've had these for many years. A lot of times I like to use a camera stand indoor studio. Outdoors I like to bring the tripod, like when I light paint a car or do nature photography or photograph a waterfall. When I use a tripod, I like to start with ISO 100. And then if without a tripod, like taking a portrait, maybe go to 3200, 1600. All depends on the ambient light. And I always want to use either a cable release or a remote when using a tripod. These are the cable releases look like. This will work for the R6. This used to, you know, use in my Canon 7D. It also works in my R5. I was very thankful that I didn't have to buy a new cable release. I could just use the same one and it works good. But if you're doing like light painting, I'd recommend the remote. And I'll bring it up next. This will work for the R6. This is, you know, and they both have the same, you know, 80 meters plus distance, 30 possible channels. It's basically the same remote, but the wires a little differently, connecting the camera. And they both have, you know, the AAA batteries, two for this and two for the switch or the control. So this used to, this will work on my 70. It also works on my R5. And I was very thankful that I have to buy a new one. So when do you use the wireless outdoors? Oh, yeah. Like if you want a live paint and you're 15 feet away, you want to use this. This for the R5 and this for the R6. So in the studio, you, you use the standard one, the wired one. Yeah, I could also use a cable, just a regular cable that's indoor studio too. Yeah, but I'm just trying to see which one they use. Oh, well, this would be like for if you're like 15 meters away from the camera. And if you want to stay near the camera, you could use this. You can also use just a regular cable release. Yeah, but when are you away from the camera and, and trying to um, uh, pull the trigger? You're always behind the camera when you're firing, right? Well, not always. When I'm light panning, I'm standing to the side. I see. Okay. Yeah. And these are, you know, if you want to bring the photo to the computer, this is a booster cable. This will boost the signal. This will go on your computer. And this will work for the R5, R6. And this will work. This is my old Canon 7D. But I used to do, you know, tethered capture in Lightroom. Then I was having con connection issues and I troubleshooted. But then there's a better way. And... It's where you use the Wi-Fi with the droid. And this is the name of my old cam, my old droid. Now, when you clean your plexiglass table, you're going to be using Novus One a lot. Twos for little scratches, threes for big scratches. If you use something like two, you want to finish up with one. And then this is great for blowing the dust. And someone asked about this. If you, you want to blow the dust before taking a photograph, you also want to clean the flex table with Novus really well with like a lint cloth. Sometimes when you take it a shot, dust will fall on the table. And that's why you want to blow the air, blow the dust out. These are all my mirrors, my mirror plates. Armature clamps, my duct tape, wire, my CRG clamps, and my spring clamps. These are my gels. You know, when I went to Plaza Arts, they don't sell this anymore. I don't know why. So it looks like everything's going online. But you can still buy this stuff at Plaza Arts or Michael's. You can buy the same thing with the draft fusion paper. This you could buy at Amazon or BH. Um, they have price differences. So 
One price was 25, one price for Amazon was 17. It's about the cheapest. This is just a Cinefill. What is it? This is called Cinefill. It's like black aluminum foil. And what do you use it for as a prop? This is like if you want to create a snoot with the light. I see. These are my scrims. These are my frame scrims with draft fusion paper. These are my plexiglass sheets. These are my two six foot scrims where this is wood from Home Depot. This is like tracing paper from Plaza Arts where it's very big. You don't need a stand. You can just rest on a strobe or a table. These are very convenient to use. You can also create a nice cool background. These are my white cards. It's great for printing backgrounds or maybe a gray background, depending where you place the light. And black, big black cards, you know, um, you're great for blocking out light, but also great for creating like a dark background, like a foam board, like in some of the black plexi photographs I showed. Now I'm going to do a new screen share. So basically, you know, I have the white card. So if you want to reset, when I start all over, I just go to reset. Now I just back to the original. But this is what I would work it in Photoshop. When I open in camera raw, it's after the white balance set. You can turn down the highlights. And click done. And for sharpening, I just want to put texture as two or three. I don't want to do too much. So what was the setup here? So explain to us where cameras obviously pointed right at the object, maybe a slight as a slight angle. Right. And then you've got the uh, softbox behind with whatever that thing you call it. Um, fusion paper. It's a fusion scrim. Fusion scrim. Then and I have then, a light coming from the left to bring this out better. OK, so that is probably much lower intensity. What, about? probably 10 to one ratio between from behind versus the side angle. It could be I think five uh, F stops different. I think it's like five. Well, um, it probably like two or three stops of light difference. And then you're getting a reflection on the bottom that is the light that's reflecting from the side angle off of the uh, cokes uh, reflecting off of the plexiglass. Right. This is the black plexiglass. Right. And you um, underexposed it because the black plexiglass looks gray. Right. You want to expose for the highlights where... Okay. You want to do a stop tighter than the reading. Okay. Now this, what I would do is I would sync the white balance. I would set the white balance and then I would just go to open and camera raw. I do control A. I would sync settings. And the basics 
the white balance and the basic. Now we use the geometry of the Chekhov geometry that I click OK. So then So what I would do, I want to start all over. I say reset the default, but I don't want to do that. I want to sync all the white balance. Open the camera raw. I do control A. I would sync the settings. And if I would, if I, if I use the geometry, I check that off, but the basic, the white balance is checked. You want to make sure you have this at least checked. And now we're going to go into Adobe Photoshop. This is what the finished product looked like. All right. Hmm. There. I have actions. So the first thing I would do is run my dodge and burn action where I would burn the velocity blend mode, I would dodge with the screen. So when I do actions, I do them grips. First this happens, and then this, I just click on the auto and I adjust it. But I also want to make the stream more darker You can do that, but I, but I don't want to dock dark. A lot of times I just click the auto and I make adjustments. And then the last part of the action is this. And I can move this. Gee, this looks more um, like a charcoal color or a uh, almost like a smoky. Um, like a tobacco color, then it does black. And you shot that on the black plexiglass, correct? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And then when I do put some sharpening, so I do my sharpening at the end where a lot of times I just like to use this one. I do dust and scratches, I do speckle, I do Sharpen high pass. So that's the scratches. I set the 1.3. And then the speckle. There's no prompt for that. And then the last action where I do the high pass. Make some adjustments. So when I run that action, what is the file here? And this, so when I run that action, let's see. I have it on like a soft blend mode. Now to get the frame. Okay, you okay? 
I call other actions when this calls, this calls, this happens, and then this action is called. Somewhere here. Then at this action, then this action, a condition where if, let's see, depending on the height, this is called, depending on the width, this is called. So if the document's landscape, it's going to run this, where I set the width to 4,000 pixels. But if it's not, then I set the height to 4,000 pixels. So now I'm not going to make any changes. I'm going to start, I'm going to open up a raw file. There's a raw file. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. I want to put a raw file. Let me get the other one. Let's see. Yeah, this is a raw file. So what I could do, I could open as a you know object. I just want to click open. So I'm gonna run. I'm gonna first. I could do it. I could save it two ways. I can go file save as, or I also create an action. I'm going to run this action. Now, I could save it as a cloud. I want to save it to my computer. I'm going to save it as, you know, test. Then, I'm going to go to my actions again. This, when I run this action, it's in a call, it's in a call or actions. There's an action for this. There's an action for this. There's an action for this. And this is the first action where I want to control I to invert the math. I'm going to make sure that I'm painting white. See, it's changing. I want to make sure it's white, but I'm painting white on a black layer mask. I want to make sure my opacity is at 100. And a flow of a 17 is good for light painting and regular painting and still life. Now I want to bring this out better. I'm going to bring this out better. Now, suppose I did a little too much in the glass. I'm going to push the X. And I push it because, I, you know, white reveals black hides. 
I'm going to throw one of my layers away because I don't need it. I'm going to move this down over here. I'm going to click the auto. But if I want to make this even more darker, I'm just using a block dropper to make bring out the blocks better. I'm going to save it. Then I'm going to do some sharpening with my grouped actions. Why is it green, Michael? Could be a color shift problem, or maybe I. Maybe because I wasn't clicking, I meant to click over here. Maybe the auto didn't work. Maybe I didn't click it firm enough. I'm going to run this. See, this is with the soft light, where when I ran that action, the last action that happens in its soft light blending mode is great for that, you know, that high, high pass filter. And then I'm going to do my frame. I'm also colorblind too. I'm going to put a frame on. I'm going to zoom in, see the nice key line that I created with that frame. I'm also going to move my signature. I'm going to save my work and save your work frequently. And then I'm going to export. I'm just going to say save for web. As I post it to web, I want to make sure I have this checked. If for the copy and paste in Photoshop, I don't want to have this checked. And then I click save. <clears throat> I'll save over here. We did the watch. Where I know this is not perfect, but sometimes if you have to make it look more pleasant, You can make, put it in like a gradient layer. Well, the angle. What I'll do is I'll just, I'm going to open it up. That's right. Now it's slightly underexposed. I was trying to compensate for the highlights. So I'm just going to open. Or I could also adjust the exposure too. But then if I look, that's why. I'm going to save it. I'm just going to do still regular save. I'll just call this test.
I'm going to run my signature combo where I call this action and make an adjustment. Then I call two other actions. I'm going to throw one layer away. I'm going to move my signature down over here. I'm going to do control I. And I want to invert the layer. And I want to be brush. Make my brush bigger. And the same thing over here. I'm going to bring up my subject more. If I do too much, I just push the X key. Push the X key. And I want to come over here. So I like this contrast. I want to make it a little. Now, what I could also do is I could put this in a selection. Now, I suppose I could do a few things. I put this in a gradient where I don't want to have, I could do that. I could have a nice cool background, but I just want to paint in, but, you know, I'm going to throw this away. You can also do something else. You know, I could put this, I'm going to put this in a regular, you know, levels. But I want to come over here. What am I doing? I'm going to find my brush. Oops. I just want to, you know, paint in my subject better because right reveals black hides. And then I want to put a frame. Actually, I'm going to do my sharpening first. There. For the dust and scratches, first filter's called. Whoops. At the 1.3, and then the other filter has no prompts, speckle, and then this last one, where the soft light, blend by the soft light, this is the last filter that I call. The high pass, and I make a change. And this is great for sharpening with contrast, but the soft light blend mode with this last layer of the action. Then I just run my frame. Now I'm going to zoom out that you see the nice key line in the frame. 
I'm going to save my work. I could also do this too. I could also go to my action. I have an action for everything. I have an action that's going to save it where quality 100, convert the sRGB. You always want to have that check to placing on the web. Here's my size over four megs. I'm going to save in the correct folder. So now what I'm going to do, let's see. I'm glad you, I'm, yeah, this will be recorded, Don. So now I'm going to do a brand new screen share. It'll be the last part of the presentation. Now what I'm going to do is This is going to be the screenshot where we talk about screenshots of Adobe. First, let's start with Adobe Camera Raw. Now, the many ways you use it basic, a lot of times I just click on, I just neutralize with the white drop with the gray balance dropper. And sometimes I could make small adjustments. I could affect the highlights and shadows. If you're sharpening, I just want to have one to three. Now for black and white photography, I just do everything in Photoshop. I used to decrease the vibrant saturation of the raw file, but I want to just leave everything in Photoshop. And for light painting, I don't touch any of this. I don't even touch the sharpening. I just set the white balance. If you have data, you could use an S curve, but a lot of times I'll leave this thing alone. I rarely ever, I never use these sliders. Sharpening, some people they go like oh, over 140 for like products. Portrait, you use 120. I just sharpen in the end. I don't touch this, but you can. Tell the nose reduction. I used to use 30-35, but I'd, like I said, I just leave the section alone. If you look for noise, you want to zoom out the 300% and just use it until the black spots go away. And make sure you click fit and view when you're done. Optics, with the R6, R5, this is automatically checked. With the 7D, it wasn't. So this is automatically checked with all my you know, files. And remove chromatic aberration removes all the color problems of the edges. The profile corrections, it's using whatever lens you're using. I like these 35, so it would say the Canon EF35. For the geometry, if you sync the properties and you use this, make sure you check this off. And a lot of times I just use the A. But if I have to straighten out the verticals, horizontals, I want to do that in Photoshop. I want to make sure you also could train the crop, but a lot of times I just use the A and it solves a lot of my problems. Now, if you have effects, you want to put like a gradient. You can have you can have a slight vignette. If you have color darkness on one part, you could use vignette, vignetting to fix it. But if you want to create a slight vignette, you could use it too. You want to look at the photograph and don't worry about the number. Image processor, where if I want to process JPEGs and light painting. And when I copy and paste the photograph, I want to make sure I do not check this convert the sRGB. If I'm posted to web, I want to make sure I do. Sometimes a lot of Photoshop with models, and I have 18 Photoshop, I just use the image processor. I want to make sure that I check this off, convert the sRGB, because I am posting to the web. Now this Photoshop, if I'm doing HCR, I have a macro that I'll do this. I would select all the layers and I'd run this macro, you know, auto align and auto blend. 
And then this I could use with any image. Like I want to use it on the background layer, make a copy of it, where I do the auto tone, auto contrast. It happens one after the other. And these are my beginning set of actions. Or sometimes I just make a duplicate, uh, run, you know, image correct, and it comes over here. Now, sometimes, like you said, I sometimes save, I have an action to save in Photoshop. Or I could just save it with the menu command of save. Dodge and burn, as I would, you know, burn with the velocity blend mode, dodge with the screen blend mode. And then use the levels, and I would have a signature for the white and black. So there's an action, action, and then action. So there's four actions with this, you know, dodge and burn group. And then I use background actions where, you know, we have high pass, the filters that I've shown. I need one two, three, one happens right after the other. This is an action, action, action. This is a group of actions. A frame development where I run this action, this happens, and then it looks for this action, does something. And then it comes over here, and then it has a condition. If it's landscape, run the width. If it's not, run the other action, height. This image size, what it looks like after to run the action with the longest size is 4,000 pixels. You have a resolution of 300. Unsharp mask is, if I'd use this alone without an action, I'd have it, the amount set to 200. I want to leave the radius to 1.0, even if I'm using HDR, because I don't want to, if I use more than 1.0, I feel like I could damage the pixel. I like to use a threshold level of six or seven, you know, levels. And then, you know, your dust and scratches, noise. Then if I use the unsharp mask and I use the fade, it'll say fade unsharp mask. It's great for, you know, contrast. And I want to use a passive of 100 and the luminosity blend mode. It's makes the, it's good for contrast when, using the fade with the unsharp mask. Maybe a noise, unsharp mask, doesn't scratch it. This is without the fade. My JPEG where I have my copyright info. Every time I use this, it's gonna ask me where I wanna save it. When I save it a location, the next time I save another JPEG, I'll go to the same location. I want to make sure that I have this convert to sRGB checked. Another way, it's quick export, similar settings. And then the action paste in place where if I'm doing light painting, I make a selection, it'll paste it wherever it is in the photograph. And it The paste in place, and then we always set the current layer to light and blend mode. And it's all this, every time I use paste and use this action, it does these two things. Paste in place and change the blend mode to light. Blend layer to light and blend mode. Then there's frequency separation where you use the high pass, it's linear light, and then the normal blend mode for the other layer. This is great for cloning. This is great for, uh, you know, Gaussian blurs. Actions are black and white, where many ways you can do black and white. We can experiment with the channel mixer. We can zero out all the RG blue, you know, individual channels. We check off the monotone. You can zero out the Vibrance, zero out the saturation. The gradient map, you can just change the blend mode of color. And the saturation, you can just zero out the saturation, the vibrance. And then if you want contrast, you just work with the lightness slider. And the threshold, you just use the color blend mode. There's another black and white where you do portraits, where you use many layers, adjustment layers. 
So my workflow looks like, like you saw in the demo. These are my photography groups. The still life is growing every day. Some of these are run by myself. Some of them run with other people. This is my meetup clubs. This is my Facebook. And then this is my fine art. I'm going to go to this. So I do a lot of timely reflections. This is my light paintings, my plexi reflections, my natural light. And my YouTube, where I have, um, I'm going to start populating landscape information. It's a new section of my still life. So now it's called still life and landscape at Michael Futuro, which is me. And my equipments and my light painting, my black plexiglass. How do you use Adobe software, white plexiglass? So, if there are any questions, I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but still life photography can be very complicated. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Excuse me, I have, I'm eating. Okay. Um, so you have a lot of presence on different sites, web, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and, yeah. and lots of other places. Are you generating revenue stream out of these sites, or why are you posting there? Well, I'm just trying to gain popularity. I'm make, I'm make, I'm make, I'm not making too much money, but maybe I will someday. And a lot of people are like this. A lot of people have YouTube, but they don't generate income, but it's a very popular. Mm -hmm. So are you uh, right now generating any income from photography? A little. I sometimes make sales on my fine art site. Okay. Yeah, because you're deep into it, uh, much deeper than most people. So trying to understand the reason for that besides just personal interest. Yeah. You know, uh, something funny, I don't use Photoshop or Lightroom at all. Really? All my images, yep, come, are right straight out of the camera. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm sort of an old timer. I'm just uh, actually thinking about getting Lightroom. Yeah. Not not Lightroom. Bad. Yeah. I've won awards and stuff, but um, yeah, and seeing what you did with, with your image, it just makes a world of difference. Yeah. All right. I would love to see a, a um, light painting presentation. Well, on my YouTube channel, yeah, they're there. I mean, oh, they're there? I'll okay. do another light painting demo in the future, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll 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 end the meeting. Let's see.